So my topic for today, I think it's called, is it called The Power of Markets? Is that the official title? Yeah. Right, so what it's really about, what I want you to think about, I, I'm going to be doing two sessions this morning. What, what I'm going to be talking about is a, a couple of different things, but what I want you to be thinking about in the background is what is the goal of economic policy? What should we be thinking about when we think about economic policy and labor economics, trade, uh, health policy, public finance, pollution, all the things that economists talk about, should there be a goal and what should it be and how should we think about it? So a lot of people would say the goal of economic policy at the national level, and many of you I'm sure aspire, hope to be someday in a position to influence economic policy at the national level, even if you don't, you're still going to be citizens. When you think about that, what should be the goal of, of economic policy? Should it be to make the rate of economic growth as great as possible? Should it be to increase GDP, gross domestic product? Uh, should it be to fight inequality? Should it be to create opportunity? So we're going to be talking about that in a little bit, but most of that's in the background. One thing I would ask you to think about, which most economists don't think about, is you could argue, I would argue, that the goal of economic policy is to allow people to reach their fullest potential. To allow people, in English we would say to flourish. In Greek we would say eudaimonia. To allow us to fully be who we desire to be. Not very important, not to have the most fun. Many people think the goal of government policy should be to create happiness, the most happiness for the most people. That's a, a form of utilitarianism, a particular philosophy. Uh, I personally find that uh, morally distasteful, which is strange because it sounds, I mean, who could be against it? The most happiness for the most people, I mean, that seems so good. But I would argue that should not be the goal of economic policy. Rather, it should be to give people the opportunity to pursue, to achieve, to dream, and to do what they feel they are meant to do. Now, economics tends to focus on money. To be careful, we could be a little more careful and say economics tends to focus on what can be measured. But we know as human beings that the things that are the most important cannot be measured. Dignity, purpose, meaning, autonomy, self-respect. These are the things that make our lives deeply meaningful. Without them, I would argue, we don't have very much. Of course, if you don't have food, you can't have much dignity either. So material well-being what we might call standard of living, which I'm going to talk about more in the second session, it's important. And you could argue it's, it should be the focus of government because it is something the government has some opportunity to control or affect, to have an impact on. Happiness, you could argue, the government's not so good at creating happiness. It's not really what it's good at. But I would suggest that what we should think about economic policy is, is creating an opportunity for us to pursue what we care most deeply about. And rather than handicapping us, allowing us to flourish, I think of it as in a very much a biological metaphor. When you think about a garden or flower, a flower, a flower needs the right kind of soil to blossom, to grow, to become beautiful, right? So the soil is not unimportant. And the government, in the case of our own flourishing, our own blossoming, has the opportunity to create a soil that will allow us to do that. And they can certainly create a soil that makes it very hard for us to do that. So I, I would ask you to think about in the background what government policies make it easier for us to flourish, to choose our own path, to do what we care about and what, are, what handicaps us. Now, the fundamental question for me is, for, for policy, 
is whether you should try to control and steer. Steer things, to steer something is, is a metaphor of a car, right? You steer a car, you drive a car in a certain direction, you head it over here or over there. It's very common for government policy to try to steer the economy in a particular direction. The alternative is to leave it alone. Okay? Now somebody said uh, in an interview recently, I was talking to them, and they said they were talking about what's, what's called on a boat the tiller. Do you know what that word? Do you know that word? I don't know what it would be in in Hebrew or Arabic, but the tiller is the thing in the back of the boat that helps you steer the boat. And, and this person was telling me that you should let go of the tiller. Let go of the tiller. I think that's not very good advice for an individual. <laughs> because if you let go of the tiller, you're going to go somewhere. Now, I don't think you should spend your life trying to get to a certain place. But, and at the same time, because it's good to find out things that you don't know now, if you plan to go here, so I have this, you know, this fantastic thing in my pocket. And if I want to go back to Yerushalayim this afternoon, it'll tell me how to get there. It'll tell me how to avoid the traffic. But what it won't tell me, Josh, what it won't tell me is whether I should go in the first place, right? That question it does not lend itself to an algorithm. That's a different kind of question. So the argument of letting go of the tiller for an individual is to say, oh, who cares where I go? I don't think that's the best attitude. It's up to you. If you're that. Some people like that, but in general, most of us don't like that. At the other extreme, I know exactly where I'm going. I don't care what happens between now and then. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. And after about a year of law school, you find out you hate it. So then I would not let go of the teller. I would push the teller over here and move away from law school, right? So there's, it, at the individual level, there is a balance between planning, because if you don't plan at all, you won't achieve things, right? You have to plan a little bit, but you can also plan too much, and you don't leave yourself the opportunity to explore. Very important. That's at the individual level. At the national level, which is what we're going to talk about today, there is a powerful argument I would suggest for sometimes, not always, sometimes leaving things alone. This does not come naturally to us as human beings. For most of us, the idea of leaving things alone at the national level is like taking your hand off the tiller. I, I, where am I going to go? I have no idea. I could go into a storm. I could end up on an island where there's no food. Why would I take my hand off the tiller? But in the, at the national level, it's a very, very different result. Here's, here's why. Let's say you come home from your day at school and you have a roommate. How many people here live with someone? Okay. And your roommate is not an, a very clean person. And after they eat, they leave all their dishes and pots in the sink. And you say, what's going on here? And you say, well, I like to leave things alone. I'm a laissez-faire kind of person. They'll clean themselves. You're going to wait a long time for the dishes to clean themselves. If you want the dishes clean, you have to clean them. If you want to turn the music down, if your roommate, you come home and the roommate is playing very loud music, you can't just hope it'll get quieter. You have to either ask them to turn it down or turn it down yourself, right? That human impulse is very powerful. It basically says, if you want something fixed, you've got to take action. You got to have a plan. And in our daily lives, in our kitchen, and in our driveway, and in our backyard, and in many other things, if you leave things alone, nothing happens. <laughs> nothing gets better, it just gets dirtier. All of a sudden, it's not just dirty dishes, you got mice or rats. Not in Israel, because we have cats. We don't get mice or rats. 
we just have a feral cat problem. Uh, another conversation. We leave that alone too, by the way. Um, so our natural impulse is when we see a problem is to fix it, which is a very good idea at the individual level. At the national level, it's complicated. So I want to give you a couple examples of why it's complicated. The, the simple answer is that there are unintended consequences in, in, a, in a complex system. Your kitchen is not a complex system. In your kitchen, cause and effect are very clear. You run the dishes, the water, you take the soap, the dishes get clean, you put them aside, they get dried, and they get clean. The national level doesn't work that way every time. Things come along that you didn't anticipate, that you didn't expect. I'll give you an example in a minute. And secondly, there are problems that get solved more effectively by leaving them alone, which is not intuitive. They're not like the dishes. So I'm going to argue today that there are certain things where leaving them alone works better than trying to control them. And there are other things where you have to control them. And the essence of good economic policy is understanding the difference between the two. So famous example of a mistake. I love this story. It's tragic, so I don't really love it. So in 1958, in China, Chairman Mao, everybody know who Chairman Mao was, the leader of China in, in the Communist Party? He decided there wasn't enough grain, there wasn't enough wheat and other things growing in the field. And he decided the problem was that sparrows, a little tiny bird, they were eating too much of the grain. And so the solution, kill the sparrows. So he started a national campaign to kill the sparrows. They killed about a billion, a billion with a B, a billion sparrows. There's, there's videos on the web of people with sticks and they're, they're, they're striking the trees and knocking the nests down. There are people with guns killing sparrows. There's trucks full of dead sparrows for the national cause of getting rid of the sparrows. What happened? The locusts, the bugs that the sparrows ate, were now free to be more numerous. They ate all the grain. <laughs> it was horrible. It's the Arbe, locusts. I don't know what the word is in Arabic. But these little bugs that the sparrows used to eat were now suddenly more numerous. And the opposite of what, this is so bizarre. If you're trying to clean the dishes, you understand maybe you or your roommate, maybe one of you is more careful, does a better job. So if you go to clean the dishes, maybe they don't get completely clean. But you would be shocked if they got dirtier because you tried to clean them. That's what sometimes happens in a complex system when you intervene un not unthoughtfully. So my suggestion is there are two ways to think about solving problems. One, in English we say from the top down, top down, meaning someone at the top passes legislation, makes commands, steers things, controls things to affect an outcome. The second way to solve a problem is from the bottom up, is to let a solution, we say in English, emerge come about. It's very unintuitive. It does not strike most people as a good idea. I'll give you an example, a couple examples. Anybody here have a pencil? Here's a real pencil. It's beautiful. This pencil, let's see if it's a really real pencil. It's an Israel Zephyr pencil. Don't know anything about it but it appears to be made from wood. Think it's true? Is it made out of wood? Is it it's? It seems to be. There are plastic pencils now because they're cheaper to make than a real wood pencil, but this appears to be an actual wood pencil. Now, in, a, in Israel, or in your country, if you're, from, if you're visiting, 
or in America, most people don't use as many pencils as they used to, right? They use pens, they have mechanical pencils. But there are a lot of places that can't afford pens and they use a lot of pencils. And if you wanted to buy a pencil today, you would walk into a store and you would go buy a pencil and you wouldn't think twice about it. But what you don't know is that maybe three or 400 million people in China who used to be on the farm, who used to farm in agriculture, moved to, a, to, to cities. And children who used to not go to school, who used to only be on their farms, suddenly were in school. And guess what they needed? Pencils. Did you notice that there were hundreds of millions of people who wanted to buy pencils who now were needed to buy them and now it might be hard for you to find a pencil? No, you didn't notice it, did you? I didn't notice it, it was a secret, it was hidden. What happened? There's no minister of pencils. There's no minister of wood. There's no minister of yellow paint to make the pencil yellow. That should have been a catastrophic disaster for people everywhere in the world who wanted to find a pencil because all of a sudden there are tens and maybe 100 million people who want to buy pencils who didn't want to buy them before. But I didn't lose any sleep over it, right? I wasn't worried about it. It just happened. Plenty of pencils for everybody. Somebody planted more trees. Somebody made more paint. Somebody made whatever they use for erasers. In America, they used to make them out of rubber. How did that happen? That's really weird. Is there some of you, anybody here uh, vegetarian or vegan, All right? So a lot more vegan food available out in the world than there was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, if you said, I, I don't eat meat, they would say, what's wrong with you? Now you go into a store and you want to know whether something's vegetarian, whether it has meat in it, there's all kinds of products. You don't like gluten? So you want that, something that's gluten free? Who decided how much to make of that for you? Why is it that you can usually find those things that you want? Where does that come from? In America, there's a crazy day once a year, it's a Sunday, where they play a game called American football in what's called the Super Bowl. How many people have seen the Super Bowl? In America, it's a major social experience. It's a national holiday. It's, it's the real Christmas of America. It is a huge celebration. Everybody gets together with their friends, and what do they do? They eat a lot of food. And there's two things they eat more of on that day than any other day. Does anybody know what they are? Chicken wings and pizza. They eat other things too, all right? Chips and hot dogs and hamburgers and but they eat a lot of pizza. I have the numbers. Um, on that day in America, they sell about 12 million pizzas, right? That's a lot of pizzas. I heard they ran out of them once. Once? Really? I don't know, maybe a lot of time. I've never heard of it, but it's possible. There could be a store somewhere. By the way, during COVID, a lot of the things I'm talking about didn't work as well as they once did, right? There are shortages of things that all of a sudden you would go into a store and not find things. So it's an interesting question of why that is. But here's the question about pizza. Let's say you don't like football and you don't like pizza, but you want something made out of flour, pasta, beer, which is made out of wheat, a croissant. Can you get those things on Super Bowl Sunday? You can, you can get those too. Why is it that when you go into a bakery on Super Bowl Sunday and you say, I'd like a dozen uh, bagels, they say, are you kidding? It's Super Bowl Sunday. All the flour went to make pizzas. We got to make more pizzas today. We didn't have room for you. Oh, but I really love bagels and I, it's my birthday and I wanted to have a brunch. I wanted to have a party. Who do you tell that to, to make sure that it's there for you? You don't call anybody. You don't have to lobby. You don't have to write your representative in the government to say, you know, on Super Bowl Sunday, I feel really important that there, uh, uh, strongly that there should be bagels. But you don't do that. You don't have to. So we're going to take, let's look at bread more generally. We're going to show a video about it. 
who's in charge of the bread tomorrow in Jerusalem or Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Rabat or Tel Aviv? Is there anybody worrying about that? Anybody losing sleep at night thinking, whoa, what, I, I'm looking forward to having some toast tomorrow. Who's worrying about that? Now, there are many people worried about it. Who are they in a certain sense? Consumers. Hmm? Consumers. Consumers could be worried about it, but I, do you ever lose sleep over it? If you're looking forward tomorrow to having a nice breakfast, do you ever say, oh, I better call ahead? I better tell him I'm coming tomorrow. When there's a need in the market, that's when the demand happens. That's when there's a need in the market, the demand happens. But how does it, what's the mechanism? Is there a person at the top who's worried about it to make sure there's enough? Now, each, of course, somebody said over here, bakers. The bakers are worried about it. But they're worried about what? If, you're, if you have a bakery, what are you worried about? Money. Money what else? Supply. You're worried what? You're worried about supplying your products to who? The people you expect to come into the store, right? Are you worried about the other side of town? No. You can't. You have no idea what's going on over there or across the country. You're only worried about your little pocket. But that's enough, we're going to see in the video, that can be enough to make sure that it turns out okay. Let's think about the alternative. Let's say we wanted to have a meeting of all the people who are worried about bread. So who would be in the room? Raise your hand. Who would tell me who would come to this meeting? The farmers. The farmers. Who else? Bakers. The bakers. Who else? Factories. What? Factories. Who? Factories. Factories. What, what, are the, what do the factories make? <coughs> Some are making bread in a factory in a more uh, institutional way, in a large scale. But of course, some of them are making the ovens that bake the bread, or they're making the trucks that do what? Deliver, Deliver the, bread. not the bread, just the bread. What else? Flops. The flour, the, everything else, the poppy seeds, the sesame seeds, all those things. Who else is in the room? Importers. What? Importers. Importers. Why? They do it on a global scale. They might be wanting to bring in bread from, from far away as a way to satisfy the customers. Who else is in the room? Raise your hand. Who else? Whoever's in charge of making packaging for the bread. For we have the, the plastic makers, or if they put the bread in plastic, or in Israel, we get it in bags. Yeah? All the businesses that use bread. All the businesses that use bread. Restaurants and so on. Who else? But we're missing a very important group. The government. The government? No, we're going to keep. This is the government. We're in charge. We're going we're gonna to solve this problem. We're going to do better than the, one, than the current system, which is just, oh, whoever gets up and says, I want some of this, or I'm here to buy that. We're going to make sure that it's done b better. Who else is in the room? Uh, the electric company. The electric company, absolutely, who, pr who provide the power for the, the, ba the ovens and so on. And also the oil companies. The oil companies who, who supply the oil for the trucks that deliver the bread and the flour. What else? The people. The people who, who like to eat. Everyone. Anyone who eats bread? Anyone who eats bread? Employees. Employees, but not just anyone who eats bread. Anyone who eats other things that aren't bread, that use the things that are on those things. Right? You think, start to think about how complicated that is. And what I really what could imagine doing, if I was going to solve this problem from the top down, I'd say, so, do you eat bread? Yes. What kind do you like? Um, spelt. Spelt. Oh, very interesting. Um, I don't know, do we have enough resources for spelt this year? I, we'll see, maybe. How about you, what's your favorite kind of bread? Uh, I don't have a favorite one, Moroccan bread. Moroccan bread? Brown bread. Brown bread? Moroccan bread. Moroccan bread. What is Moroccan bread? Help me out here. A flat, is it like a, is it like a laffa in, in Israel? No, 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 no. you can open it, yeah. It's a bit fluffy. A fluffier, okay, yeah. very nice. Pita. Pita? Bagel. Also bagel. Bagel. Cereal bread. Cereal bread? What, yeah, like uh, whole wheat or maybe a whole grain? Yeah. Dense, a... yeah. No. That too? Frena. What is it? Frena. Frena. What is that? It's like, it's like the Moroccan bread. Okay, very nice. There's, there is a, uh, there's a kosher bakery in San Francisco that's called Frena. I, now I know why. I didn't know that word. Okay. Like baguettes. Baguettes, very, oh. Fancy. I don't think we have room for him. Now, you know. So think about it. How do I, I'm in charge. I'm the minister of bread. 
And remember, there are other people around the room who don't like bread but like pasta, who don't like bread who like pizza, and they say, whoa, 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 don't give away too much for the Moroccan bread. Don't give away too much flour for the frana. What about mine? I got pizza. You know, how do you settle all of those competing demands in a way that, anyway, figure out, you tell me how you want me to do it. You want it to be fair? I, I don't know what fair is. If, does fair mean everybody gets as much as they want? It could be. You could argue. That's one definition of fair. What's the problem with that definition? The effort of uh, product, producing uh, some bread is uh, higher than the others. For sure. But that's on, it would, let's say, who, you were, uh, what was your kind? Spelt. Spelt. Spelt's very expensive. It's hard to grow spelt. A lot of times it goes bad. It gets rotten. The rain ruins it. What's your name? Imbar. Imbar, what's, what's spelt? Now, you could argue that because spelt is hard to make, she should have to pay a little bit extra. But is that fair? I mean, that's not fair. It's not her fault that she likes spelt, right? It could be a health reason. She might need to eat spelt. Rather, so if anything, she should get a break. That would be more fair, maybe. Why is fair, though, a problem? The reason fair is, a, it, it, there are many ways to conceptualize fair. But, yeah. It depends on the demand. So if there's more demand, you can't be fair because the demand is lower there. So you can't give equal amounts because the demand is higher. Right, but I, so one answer would be, fair means if there's different demands in different cities or different demands for different kinds of bread, if I try to meet all of them rather than say, share among yourselves somehow, if I try to meet all of them, the biggest problem is the pizza people. They're saying, what about me? Where, where, where's my meeting? I want my pizza too. And if all of the land is growing all the stuff for the pizza and uh, the flour for the pizza and the flour for the different kinds of bread and the frena and the whole wheat and the, it's the brown bread and so on, what else do we lose and that would be hard to answer. We'd have to figure out, is that fair? That the people who want those other things that we can't grow now, because we can't grow everything, where are they going to get their opportunity? Um, so at least, uh, let's talk about our government in Bahrain. So our government first looks at basic needs of people. So it looks at, for us, we have Arabic bread, which is a common stop out of color, um, where it's like a flat bread, a big oven to, um, to, to make the bread, a really huge oven, flame oven. So this is like the necessity, which is very cheap. It's subsidized. Uh, you can buy it, you can buy like five pieces for like half a shekel or something. Okay. Uh, so this is um, there's always you cannot lose supply. They always make sure that there is enough. Um, but then for everything else, then the, the prices are all uh, move around. Yeah, move around. It's I think we do something similar in Israel. I think there is some bread that is subsidized here. Whether that's a good idea or not is another question. But what I want you to think about is how complicated it would be, no matter what rule I used, fair, what definition of fair, whatever rule I used, we would spend an unbelievable amount of time trying to understand what people wanted. And then a month from now, if things changed, would we have another meeting? Would we have a meeting every day of the three billion people who are interested in bread? What's amazing about the bread market is that we don't have to talk. We don't have to think. We don't have to have an argument. I want spelt, I want more of my kind. The result is shocking. The result in every city of the world, more or less, and there's one exception, in almost every city and every country in the world, you can get bread when you want. Now, sometimes it's more expensive if it's not subsidized. You could subsidize some of it. But in general, it's available. It's available for you to make the choice to buy what you want. Now, everybody doesn't get exactly what they want. There might be times when there's no spelt. Some people here might have a special kind of bread they want that's hard to find. When we moved here, we like, my wife and I like sourdough bread. There's, it was hard for us to find sourdough bread that was really good here in Israel, but we've we found some. Yeah? Um, I also want to talk about the 
about the point that not everyone has the luxury to choose what bread they want to eat. Because, for example, the shabza diet meat is a uh, 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 bread, sorry, is a um, is basic one that everyone needs, and uh, mostly it's the bread that uh, everyone can can afford. And not everyone has the the luxury or the resources to afford any kind of bread. They True, want. and not in the quantity they want either, right? Exactly. So the market doesn't fix every, it's not magic. Well, there's magic to it, I'll suggest, but it doesn't work perfectly, right? And you might decide that even though you're going to leave most of it alone, you might decide to subsidize the basic kind. You might. I would argue that in general, if you leave that alone and you will let enough competition take place, you will push the price down even more. But you could still argue that people need help affording it because some people are very poor, for sure. Okay. Uh, why does it work so well to the extent it does work well? Why is it that there's a lot of bread available in most places? And I would say there's two keys. We could talk about this for the whole. We could spend the rest of the semester. We don't have a semester. We could spend the rest of our time together of this week talking about how the bread market works effectively. I would suggest there are two things that matter. Competition, because without competition, it doesn't work very well at all. And there's a magic part, which are prices. Prices are like a thermostat. How many people know what a thermostat is? A thermostat is a device on the wall that sends signals to the heating or cooling in response to the temperature. Right, like right now, I think the thermostat's too high. Do you agree? Is it, a little, is it a little warm in here? Can we make it a little cooler? Prices are constantly sending signals to suppliers and consumers about what is scarce and what is plentiful. So if you like, I'm sorry to pick on you, Inbar, I apologize. I hope it's okay. It's meant in, with affection. If you like something that's expensive or you need something that's expensive because it's crucial for your life, but it's expensive. If you have a lot of children, you need a bigger car if you're gonna drive your children around. You don't have to have a car, it's not a necessity. I don't have a car, it's fantastic by the way, I wanna recommend it. But if you have to have a car for your work or you wanna drive your children to school and you have a lot of children, you have to have a big car, right? And a big car is gonna be more expensive than a small car. And that's gonna be more expensive than a motorcycle, which is gonna be more expensive than an electric bicycle, which is gonna be more expensive than a plane bicycle. So. The higher priced things, the things that cost more resources, discourage people from using them. And the lower priced things encourage, like today at the buffet, at breakfast, or at lunch today. What's the price of one more bareka to you? Zero. So you might have taken a couple extra and left them on the plate. Did any, I won't ask. But you might have been a little less careful, right? But prices are constantly pushing us to buy a little bit more or a little bit less. And sometimes that's very painful. But what it achieves, the prices are what allow us to go to a store and in advance not be worried, to know that it's going to be there, that I, can, I don't have to call ahead. And that's an amazing thing. My, uh, the late Walter Williams, who's a colleague of mine at George Mason University, used to say, and in a way, this, is, this, this little quote is the essence of economics. He said, here is my relationship with my grocery store. I don't tell them when I'm coming. I don't tell them what I want to buy. And I don't tell them how much I want to buy. But if it's not waiting for me, I fire them. I go somewhere else, right? Unless all the stores have empty shelves. It's like what's happening now with the inflation in the United States. 
Say, say again. It's like what's happening now in the, with the information in the United States when people like used to go to, like, for example, Whole food like a grocery shop, and now they like because of the prices are high, higher than they used to be. So they went to they switch their grocery shop to like a cheaper one. Right, but that's not just oh, infl- that for those of you who didn't hear that. When, what's your name? Sultan Al-Masir. What is it? Sultan Al Masir. Let's see. <laughs> Sultan. <laughs> Tada. Sultan. Shukran. So uh, Sultan. Was saying that in in America right now, because inflation is high, some people are switching from expensive grocery stores like Whole Foods to less expensive ones. But of course, the problem is is the less expensive ones also have some inflation. So it's not necessarily going to solve make that make that easier. Inflation is a more complicated thing. I'm going to put it aside for the moment. So, bottom line, hang on. I'm going to suggest that a market system, a market system where bread is provided by the profit motive, bakers trying to make money, are are bakers greedy? Yes. There seems to be some uncertainty about the right answer to that question. I would say bakers like money, just like we all do. They like more money than less. But would would you argue that Bakers get up at five in the morning or four in the morning because they're greedy? No, they're I don't think so. What do you think? They want, to live. they want to live. They want to take care of their family. They want to take care of themselves. They want to have the opportunity to go on vacation. They want to watch a great movie. They want to do all the things that human beings want to do. And I would also suggest that they get joy from baking bread. Some of them, not everyone. Some of them, oh, my father was a baker. I'm a baker. My mother was a baker. I'm a baker. But many people think this is the greatest job in the world. I get paid to make people not be hungry. I get paid to create what allows them to throw a party. It's an amazing thing, right? So there's an, a, a, the monetary incentive, the money part of it is not unimportant, but it's not the whole story. But, The fact that if you were a bad baker, no matter how much you love baking bread, if you're not good at it, you're going to have trouble staying in business because you're going to lose money compared to what? Your competitors. Your competitors, the competition, is what keeps you, sends signals to you that you are not good at this and you should maybe do something else. So... I would argue that many things in the world around us work not just well, but best if left alone. But there are other things that don't work well if left alone. Obvious example, pollution. If while you're making bread, you put poison into the air, the trucks that drive around that are causing the air to be dirty Those are not going to be solved by the profit and loss motives that drive the baker. The opposite. It's fantastic to dump my garbage in somebody else's yard. Now, I may feel guilty about that, right? I I may have some natural response to reduce the impulse to be harmful to other people. But in general, pollution needs to be solved from the top down. It can't be solved by leaving it alone and the bottom up. So one way to think about public policy, economic policy, is trying to think about what problems the government solves well and what problems the government solves badly. Now, if, if, the government does not solve a problem well, and I want to leave it alone, you might think that therefore the problem must be solved by business, by what we're calling the profit motive, right? The profit motive is the idea that if I do my job well, I can get money. And if I do my job poorly, what happens to me? I go out of business. 
Milton Friedman used to like to say, it's a profit and loss system. It's not a profit system. Profit and loss. You need both profit and loss. Especially for investment, by the way. It, when you're investing for the future, not talking about a consumer good, the profit encourages me to do what? Take a chance. Take risk. But the loss reminds me to what? Be careful. Be prudent. If you take away the loss, if you bail out or compensate or subsidize investors who make mistakes, guess what you get? Less careful investing. You get recklessness. Terrible mistake. So I want to make it clear, this is a subtle point, but extremely important, that the opposite of government is not business. I am not pro-business. That is a horrible, horrible policy perspective. I'm pro-market, not the same thing. And only pro-market where it's appropriate. But people confuse the market and business. They're not the same. The real distinction is between voluntary and involuntary, between top down and bottom up. And the reason it's important is that there are many things that happen in the world that are not profit motivated, that are not business, that make the world a better place. Right, so the government makes the world a better place sometimes, sometimes it makes the world a worse place. Depends what it does. Right? If it puts people in, in concentration camps, in the gulag, it's horrible. If it kills sparrows, it's horrible. It makes lots of mistakes, like everybody does. But the things that the government does well, it should do well. But the alternative is not, oh, well, let's turn it over to business. The alternative is to turn it over to whatever grows, whatever happens. Because there's another thing that's important to remember. It's what we're doing right now. This is not a profitable enterprise. Think about this. What we're doing right now is not for profit. Why are we doing this? Why are we together? Why are we spending the day the, and tomorrow and the next day together? We're doing it because someone had a vision that it would be nice if people were exposed to ideas they might not normally understand or be, be taught. But you're not paying for it. That's like free bread, right? It's weird. You have very little skin in the game. Why are you here? A lot of reasons, right? It's complicated. Meet interesting people, chance to go to Israel. That's all fun. But I assume you're mostly here because you're curious. You're intellectually alive. You want to learn about something that might be of use to you, that might be of interest to you. Who's paying for it? Not you. Weird. That's weird, that's not a business. The power of a business is that you pay for the bread. If it isn't good, what happens? You don't go back. That's the profit and loss incentives that are so powerful. Those are, in English we call those feedback loops, right? Feedback loops are things that encourage or discourage certain kinds of behavior. This is a weird one. We've cut the feedback loop. There's no, we're not charging. Are we charging? We're not charging, are we? I don't think we're charged. Are you paying anything for this? Are we paying you to come? Really weird, right? But this is a this is a what we call in English a nonprofit activity in Hebrew amutah. This is a nonprofit, which is a weird word when you think about it. Like weird. No, it's not, there's no profit. There's no profit. Also, you mean something kind of good. But some there are a lot of some of the best things in in the in a society come from people getting together donating money rather than selling a product. So there's, I'll just say this to close and then we'll watch a video. There are different ways that we cooperate with each other. If you think about the great human experience of the things we do together, which are amazing. Now I like to do a lot of things. I'm not a great cooperator, right? collaborator, right? If you, if you write a book, it's hard to write books with other people. I don't, some people do. Josh, have you done it? No? Have you written articles with other people? Yeah, articles, sure. I don't like doing that either. 
I kind of like to sit in my, in my office by myself, think deep thoughts, ideally, not always, and, and write, do my work. I've, I'm an academic. The reason people go into academic life is they like being alone. They don't like people telling them what to do. They don't like having to get other people to do, agree with them. But you discover, most of us, not all of us, some of us are really peculiar, but most of us like to work with other people. There are three ways to do it. One is through the government, right? The government is a collective enterprise through the vote and other institutions that we work together to achieve things we care about, national defense, whatever it is. The second way we work together is in business. I get investors. I start a bakery. I hire employees, right? If I'm not careful, I look at my employees as my employees. They're not my employees only. They're also my teammates. They're people on my team. We're doing this together. A great baker is able to get the other people working to feel they're part of something bigger than themselves, right? Political causes are obviously people thinking I'm achieving something greater than myself. A business should be the same way. It can be the same way. And then there's a nonprofit. The third way we collaborate, right? My school, where I teach, where I work, where I'm the, where I'm the president. I'm not, there's no profit. All of our money comes from people donating to us. You have any extra? We always can use more. Anybody have any money? I have to raise money. It's weird. Our students, they don't pay. It's fantastic for them, right? Maybe. So there's a certain, no one likes it. Okay, fine. No one's our Shalem representative here. It's a wonderful thing, mostly, but it also means, in general, when you give people things, they don't, in my experience, always, they don't always take care of them as carefully as if they earned them and worked for them themselves. But this group today, we've decided that you're going to come without paying because we're afraid you won't come otherwise. And I think it'd be true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would like to argue maybe for the idea that leaving things alone. Sorry. I'd like to argue for the idea I'll that I'll repeat maybe, it. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll repeat your comment. Yeah. Maybe leaving things alone doesn't always work, but you do want to apply a strategy to what I want to do. So if I will take the bread example, if I will leave everything alone, maybe I won't have grain and maybe it won't happen. Or maybe there will be a war in Ukraine and we'll be missing 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the grain in the world and me having a strategy saying okay this is the line 100 percent 100 percent what's your name johnny johnny's saying that doesn't mean there's no planning right but the fact that we leave things alone the baker can't leave things alone the baker doesn't show up at work and go well i hope the bread bakes itself today the bread the baker is very focused on getting enough wheat and sesame seeds and so on so at the individual level again for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talked before you said a uh, core uh, of the economic thinking is to distinguish between things that the government can do well and need to intervene and things that the government should leave out for Correct. the market. Uh, and we get the example of the climate change as an externality that is not solved by the market. Correct. And maybe the government needs to intervene. But, um, the strong case for a free market in the strong sense. For example, I read a, a blog post of uh, John Cochrane, and he said that- Smart man. Living, uh, John Cochrane. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, leaving the, the, even the issue of climate change alone, uh, taking into account that in the long term, he says that it won't affect GDP as much as we think, and it will be a small decrease in GDP that we need to think about an alternative to let the market figure out adaptive ways. Yeah. For example, we're trying to reduce emissions, but maybe trying to what? We're reduce. trying to reduce emissions, but he is suggesting that another way of thinking about the problem is to say, find better ways to live sure. under climate change, rising temperatures, and et cetera, just to be adaptive to the situation and not to try to eliminate it. So my question is, in this, in this case, the government can be like have a top-down thinking and say, say, 
this is an externality that the market or the players in the market need to pay because the market doesn't sure. catch it. Yep. But there is always the argument that it isn't really an externality, but the market will figure out a way sure. to work with it. So how can we think we should really? What's your name? Uh, Moshe. Moshe. So Moshe is arguing that he's uh, drawing on a piece by John Cochran, uh, economist at Stanford, smart guy, that I kind of agree with in this case. But the argument is, there's a classic argument that with something like climate change, the government has to intervene, as I implied when I was talking about pollution more generally. There are different ways it could intervene, by the way. It can intervene in a more top-down way and a less top-down way. It could intervene by putting a tax on carbon, in which case you're allowing natural incentives to go to work. But this is a more extreme argument, which is maybe we just leave it alone completely and people will figure out ways to cope with it as it gets worse. I'm sympathetic to that argument, but it is a dangerous argument because it, I don't think the real effect of climate change is lower GDP. I think the real effect possibly is extinction of important species, ecosystems, human beings, I don't know. And it really comes down, it's a much more complicated question about risk and uncertainty and how to, how to design policy in a, in a world that's highly uncertain. My personal belief is that I don't think the current levels of carbon are going to lead to catastrophic outcomes and that adaptation may be a solution. Keeping in mind, by the way, that if you leave things alone now, you allow growth perhaps to be higher to give us the resources to take care of it when it's worse. But it's a high risk, it's not a, that's not an obvious truth. So I just wanna say, it's an interesting perspective. I'm glad I'm not in charge of it. It's a tough question. I'm gonna pause here. We're gonna show, uh, so this video, this video illustrates what I've been talking about. It's, um, the title is a joke, a pun. There's a American movie called It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody seen that movie? Anybody? One of the greatest movies ever made. You're, guar you're guaranteed to cry. It's a fantastic movie. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. But this is It's a Wonderful Loaf. And I got the idea for this from a paragraph or a page by the French economist Bastiat, who wrote exactly what I told you earlier, that no one goes to bed at night in Paris, in Paris, worrying about whether there's gonna be enough bread in the morning. If you look down upon a city with the widest bird's eye view, you might wonder how it functions who takes care of me and you? Who makes sure there's food for vegans and for carnivores as well? It seems like there's a wizard who has cast a magic spell. Just think of one small part. Who makes sure there's so much bread? You want rice, you want ciabatta, or make it sourdough instead? A baguette or a croissant? It doesn't matter, don't you see? You get yours and she gets hers and I get mine. How can that be? One's buying a dozen bagels to grace an impromptu brunch. One's using food stamps for a simple loaf to make her children lunch. No matter the amount we require, no matter the choices we make, an army of workers has mobilized to fashion the bread we partake. The farmer who grows the wheat, the miller who grinds the flour, the baker and all the others who work hour after hour, they're all on their own, each one making independent decisions. But somehow, their plans fit together with the greatest degree of precision. So there must be a czar of wheat and flour, of trucks and of bread and yeast to allocate and oversee and plan, at the very least, for the unexpected change. What if today's not like yesterday? It never is, though, is it? So who keeps chaos away? Because there's order all around us. Things look as if they're planned. Like the supply of bread in a city, enough to match up with demand. And though flour is used for more than just bread, 
We never have to fight over where it goes and who gets what. So why do we sleep so well at night, knowing nobody's in charge? It looks like all is left to chance. And in New York or London, as well as Paris, France, no one's worried the shelves will be empty. We take supply for granted. But it's a marvel, it's a miracle. The world's somehow enchanted. Of course, the result's never perfect, but the system's organic, alive. Over time, fewer people go hungry, and more and more bread lovers thrive. And if you're allergic to gluten, there are sellers who work for you, too. Your choices expand, and what you demand is created and waiting for you. I have my tastes, and you have yours. We each have our own urges, yet somehow there's no conflict. A harmony emerges. Our dreams can fit together like a quilt that someone weaves us. But there isn't a weaver of dreams. Reality deceives us. And here's the crazy thing. If someone really were in charge to make sure that bread was plentiful with the power to enlarge the supply of flour and yeast and of bakers and ovens too, would that person with that power have any idea of what to do? Could a minister of bread do even half as well? Would there be enough of every kind of bread upon the shelves? How could he know how much to make of each kind every day? There'd be shortages and surpluses and waste and much dismay. You might think the job is easy. If the top sellers rye, then for every variety, push production up that high. Then no one's disappointed. Bread eaters will rejoice when they see that every bakery is filled with so much choice. Bread eaters, yes, but help. The forgotten pizza lover cries, all the flour's gone to baking bread. There's none left for the pies of pepperoni, deep dish, thin crust and Sicilian. You've solved the bread challenge, yes, but created another million problems. No problem, we'll just grow lots more wheat. But that means less of something else that people like to eat, which only makes the puzzle of the harmony around us much more puzzling. This order, this piece, has to astound us. So many things we count on, yet no one's behind the curtain. No wizard, no controls, yet the supply of stuff near certain. Every morning, the bakers rise early to make sure your bread is fresh. And the world gets more complicated, but the plans just continue to mesh. Every morning the bakers rise early, though not under anyone's command. Where in the anatomy textbooks can I view an invisible hand? The key to the process is prices and the freedom to shop where you want. Competition among all the bakers. Make sure that they rise before dawn to make sure the bread's near perfection, to make sure that the buyer's content. You don't have to know economics to know when your money's well spent. We know there's order built into the fabric of the world of nature. Flocks of geese, schools of fish, and every boy and girl delights in how the stars shine down in all their constellations. And the planets stay on track and keep the most sublime relations with each other. Order's everywhere, yet we humans too create it. It emerges, no one intends it, no one has to orchestrate it. It's the product of our actions, but no single mind's designed it. There's magic without wizards, if you just know how to find it. Um, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, how would the government know when to get involved and when just to take the market to do its... So that's uh, a deep question. Um, And how many people here study economics? Raise your hand. Okay, so in my experience, most people assume in economics classes that the government motivation is what? What motivates the president, the prime minister, the, raise your hand, what, what, what's their, what, so let me, let me say it differently. All of us, if I had to, in, in economics, 
if I had to say what motivates us, if I, uh, from the perspective of an economist, what does an economist say our, our goal is as individuals? Raise your hand. What, what is the economist view of human behavior? Maximize utility. utility. In the case of business profit, but in the case of an individual, utility. How many people have heard that before? Now, it's a very, un, in a way, it's a very uninteresting statement. Why? What is utility? But what do we assume? Raise your hand. What do we assume? That this utility is, comes in the form of like, money. Not necessarily. Or economic um, ability. Or? Welfare. Well-being. Well happiness. Satisfaction. We put all kinds of vague words on it, right? But what I mean is that like, the, the classic Economists cannot um, describe uh, happiness or uh, you know values that can't be measured. Um, so how does so how does there such a thing as economics? So I think like what, what I was um, trying to say is that the, the classical measure, which doesn't work all of the times, is like pretty much money. But no, it's not necessarily. So for example, most people do not not most almost everyone does not take the job that pays the most money, right? If you have a chance to take work and you can do all kinds of different things, do you, do you try to maximize your salary? No. What else do you care about? Your well-being. What do you mean by that? How would that why would that be relevant when you choose a job? How about ethical issues too, right? Yes. You want to do something that is, that is, you won't go crazy, right? You, you don't want to go crazy. You don't want to have huge pressure, right? You want to do something also maybe that what? What else could you care about? Interest. What? Interest. You like it. What else? Career. What do you mean by career? It'll lead to other things. What else? What? Free time. How much leisure do you have? How many hours a week? All these things matter, right? So the economist looks at all in the economic model of human behavior. Everything counts, and I'm constantly making trade-offs between, yes, money, which I care about, but I also care about other things, right? And when I, guess what? You're not like me, and you're not like him, and he's not like you, et cetera. We're all different. So the economist, the brilliance of economics is to say, I don't know what makes you happy. I don't know what you care about compared to this person over here. You might like money more than leisure compared to this person, right? So all, when I make those decisions, I'm trying to weigh all those different things, okay? So that's the economist view of human behavior. It's a pretty good model. I, I've written a critique of it recently, so I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna defend it too hard. But that's generally way, the way we assume in economics people make decisions. It's the way they behave. They, they look at what they care about. Money is one of the things. And money, of course, is not, most of us don't care about money by itself. We care about what? What we can do with the money. The goods we can buy, the services we can buy, the vacations we can take, and so on. What does a politician care about? Re-election. Probably. What else? Promotion. Promotion. What else? That's the career part. What else? They might have principles. Maybe. Sometimes. Maybe. Just like us, right? I have principles. There's some things I wouldn't do that I would feel dishonest and dirty, right? I would feel ugly if I did them. So I don't do everything that crosses my mind, right? That I, want. I don't do everything I want to do, right? Somebody said the difference between a crazy person and a normal person is that the same things come into both people's heads, but the crazy person does them or says them. Normal people keep them to themselves, right? Some truth to that. If you could see the things that come into my head, and if I could see what comes into your head, well, I'm walking around here like, 
why is he wearing that shirt? It doesn't go with the pants, right? All, you don't blurt that out. When I say any comments, yeah, why'd you use that, pick that shirt today, right? We, we constrain ourselves all the time. So we have values, we have principles. Do we keep them? Sometimes, right? The economist's view of principles is a very ugly one. What's the economist's view of principles? You keep them unless what? It's too expensive, right? If it gets so expensive to keep your principles, then you'll eventually give in. The statement, it's an ugly statement. Every man has his price, right? You might say, I don't want to do that. Well, I can give you more money. I still don't want to do it. But there's an amount of money, supposedly, that a person will do certain things. I like to think that's not always true. I think that's a very ugly view of human beings, but that's the basic economist's view, is that incentives matter, and they often do. But how is it, who, I don't remember who asked the question. Uh, what's your name? Shani. Shani? Was it Shani or was it somebody else? Shani? Shani asked, what, what's the, uh, what's the gov how do you decide what the government's going to do? In economics, we often assume, which is very bizarre, what do we assume about the government? It's going to do what? It's going to care about for the citizens. Interesting. I care about the citizens too, but sometimes, guess what? I don't always pick up the trash, right, that's not mine, right? I dropped a fork at breakfast on the floor. I did pick it up. There's no video, but I did pick it up. Because I care about the citizens, okay? But how much time do I spend doing those things versus my own family, et cetera, et cetera? But in, in, in most textbooks, we assume government, I love this expression, what is government's job? To do the will of the people. You ever heard that expression? To do the will of the people. Well, you know what I ask? Which people? <laughs> if they don't agree, if there's an invasion and you're worried about life and death, usually everybody wants to be protected. Other than that, there's no will of the people. There's some people want one thing and some people want another. And then you have to have a mechanism for deciding who counts more. Now, in the marketplace, what's the mechanism? Price and money, income. Now, here's what's amazing off the subject a little bit, but very important. The rich people don't get all the bread. The rich people don't get all the cars. The rich people don't get all the phones. So the system, the market system, not perfect, very much not perfect. Sometimes a loaf of bread gets burnt. Sometimes people get burnt, get hurt. It's not perfect. But what's amazing about the market is how the benefits can be spread beyond the people who have the money today. Somebody gave the example the other day. I can't, I can't remember the details, but it goes something like this. He said, in my town, when I was a little boy, he came in a, from a small town in South Africa. He said, when I was a little boy in South Africa, there were 5,000 cars in my town. Now there's 60,000. OK? Here's the question. Who has fewer cars now that his town has more? Nobody. Where'd they come from? Thin air? Came from an increase in productivity. It came from technology, the production of wealth. It's an amazing phenomenon, and easily forgotten. But to come back to your question, who's gonna, who gets to vote? Who gets the power? Is it, is it a democracy? Is it majority rule? No. Almost no system in the world uses majority rule for outcomes. It uses it for elections, right? But not always, but sometimes, but not for outcomes. So what determines what the government should, not should do, we, we, have all, we all have our own idea, right? You might want more government than I do. You might want less. You might want it to intervene over here, but not over here. But what actually happens? What are the 
forces that drive the outcomes in the political market. And that's a whole area of study. You could call it political science. You could call it public choice is what it's called within economics. But most of the time, people in the back of their mind have a romantic, idealistic view the government will do, quote, what's best. Is that true? Sometimes, but sometimes not. But often in economics, we assume the government will do the right thing, even though the right thing is not defined, literally not defined. We'd have to decide what the right thing is. Forget about corruption. Forget about special favors for friends, right? It's like, um, I like it when people say, if we had private, I'm not, a, I'm not an anarchist, by the way. You know what an anarchist is? No government. I'm not, I'm not an anarchist. If you had to put a label on me, I'm what's called a classical liberal. I want limited government and personal responsibility. But if you, some people are real anarchists. They don't want government doing anything. So they'll say, I want private police. Crazy idea. And what would happen with private police? Who would get most of the protection? Rich people. How's it work now with public police? Who gets most of the protection? Rich people. <laughs> it's horrible. Poor people get horrible police protection. Oh, we should have public we should have private schools instead of government schools. Oh, well, if we did it that way, the rich would get all the good schools. Who gets the good schools now under the public system? The rich. Who gets the crummy schools? The poor. It's a bad system. Terrible system. Talk about it a little bit in the next session. Anyway, I'm rambling. Let's ask it. Let's take another question. Yeah, Noam. I'd like to follow on uh, Shanine's question. The bread market has been with us for a long time, and it's a constant need through civilization for thousands of years, and it had time to, to mature into the beautiful thing that now. But in the beginning of the Corona, there was a, a, a rush to get uh, breathing machines because it was like it, it turned out not to be true. But at the sure. beginning, they thought like this is the time to get as many as we can, and we can't trust the markets or business because each country will order them to themselves. And like it was a big government step to say we did everything we can to scrounge them from wherever. So my question is, like here is a thing that could be left up to the market, but could take too much time, or we don't have, like the, the gradual process isn't, like this is a real crisis right now. So. Should the government intervene in that kind of situation? Well, it's funny. President Trump uh, mobilized General Motors to make ventilators, to make breathing machines, right? And we had a ton of them, all very quickly. Prob probably more quickly than with a private solution, a market solution. As you point out, it didn't, turned out not to be necessary. I think the private market would have made the same mistake mistake, I don't consider that a real mistake, but I think people would have invested in capacity for ventilators if they were allowed to make a profit. Now, of course, they weren't allowed to make a profit. And I know that because the mask market, very interesting, in 25 years, people will write books about the insanity of masks during COVID. So listen, my children, I was alive then. Let me tell you what it was like. It's true. I, you know, I think you probably remember it in this case. But years from now, people will talk about what happened. My father died shortly before COVID. He actually had uh, MERS, which is another respiratory virus like COVID. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. It's not why he died. He died for a hundred other reasons, I'm sure, but he had all kinds of physical problems. But while he was in the hospital, he had a bad respiratory disease with his other problems. So this is March of 2020. And I go into the hospital and to go into his room, this is just a couple, little bit of uh, anthropology in America. I, to go into the room, you had to put on a mask which I had never put on in my life, right? We all now know what it's like to put on a mask. And I had to put on a special uh, gown, a special robe, 
to protect me from the germs. The doctors didn't, were not careful about the mask for themselves or the robe. And they would be in the room doing things to my father and I would say, you know, he has MERS. Don't you want to put a mask on? And she said, the nurse says to me, oh, everybody on this floor has MERS. It's like, we all have MERS, right? Because it's just too hard to keep you, it's too easy to get it. And I said to her, you know, there's this thing, Corona, and there's, everyone's going to want these, these masks. And we both laughed because they had boxes and boxes. You know what else they had? They had an infinite supply of Purell. It's everywhere in, a, in an American hospital, everywhere. It's on the walls, it's on the desk. There's tons of it. Two months later, three months later, you can't buy Purell. There are no masks anywhere. People on the web are telling you how to make a mask out of a sock, right? <laughs> really, out of a sock. Um, and so people are desperate for masks. Now, I believe <coughs> that a paper mask, which is what most of us were wearing, has very little help in fighting COVID. That's my belief. I base that on people smarter than I am, which is dangerous. But it's better than people who are dumber than you are, right? It's complicated trying to figure out what the truth is. It doesn't hurt to wear a mask, except that your child doesn't see your smile and your wife doesn't see your smile and your husband doesn't see your smile. And that's, I think, important. But it was a, probably a good idea to wear a mask. And in the early days of COVID, I said people should wear masks. And I thought it was a huge mistake that President Trump didn't come on stage with a mask and so on. The official government position in the early days of COVID was that masks don't help. Might have been true. But the reason that they did said that was because they wanted to make sure that the doctors had enough masks. Because they were at much greater risk than I was. I stayed away from people the first year of COVID, literally. I stayed six feet away from almost everyone outside of my wife, right? We had friends over for a meal. They would sit on the other end of the table, outside. We were all very scared. I would go into the grocery and I would put plastic gloves over the handle of the cart so I wouldn't touch the cart. We would wash the cans when we got them home the first month. Eventually we got sick of doing it. it turned out totally irrelevant. No effect whatsoever, but we didn't know that. So we were careful. But everybody wanted a mask. There were people, by the way, just, I, this is kind of amazing. The masks that doctors wear and nurses in the hospital are not the masks that you wear. They are fitted to their face, right? You wear them. When you and I wear them, there's holes in them on the sides and there's air coming out and in. Doctor, you know, people would say, boy, it's hard to wear an N95 all day. You know why? Because their N95 is not your N95. Their N95 is it's a very serious protection. Very hard. So it was a serious, horrible thing. The government decided to make sure there was no market in masks. They did not want people to make profit from other people's fear. And so you could not sell masks at a profit. And many people were arrested for trying to make money selling masks. Now I've written many essays about this phenomenon. If you're interested, I can send them to you. It's a very, um, to me, a very interesting social question. But the, here's the tragedy. If you're not going to allow the market to work, which is a legitimate view, because you don't want income to be the decider of who gets a mask and who doesn't, which is a legitimate, very important argument, then the government has to make a lot of masks. They've got to mobilize resources to do that if they're going to stop the market from working. And they do this, government does this tragically, you know, all the time. Just, I'll talk a little bit about it in the next session, but you know, the, to me, the, the single biggest mistake that the government makes in most cities in, a, in America, certainly in Israel, maybe in your country, for those of you who are coming from outside Israel, is the way they restrict housing availability in the cities where there's the most economic opportunity. It's a terrible restriction on, on the opportunity for people to flourish. 
And it's basically, to come back to our question that, that Noam and Shani asked, you know, the government, who do they listen to? The people who build developments, who build complicated buildings, who build shopping malls, who build big, fancy infrastructure, government talks to those, politicians talk to those people. They are powerful. The everyday person is not powerful. It's a tragedy. Yeah. Five more minutes. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about the two key components of markets. Do what? The two key components are prices and competition. You said. Uh, I wanted to ask about prices and particularly on price control. Uh, so the strongest saying for uh, pro uh, price control is that we want to ensure that a specific price of a certain good. I'm not gonna. Uh, talk about which good it is basic because it's undefined it's yeah it's really hard to answer it but let's just say there are specific goods that uh, we decided they are basic and and the government said okay i want to ensure that those goods are have a specific price and this will never change no matter what so how does uh, this say uh, meet this theory or contradicts it that's the question. So, um, I remember the first, first thing you said was, oh, yeah. So, uh, on this webpage, wonderfulloaf.org, there's a, if you go to that page, you'll see on the side, learn more. And I have a few dozen essays, a book, just on this question of price controls, gouging, crises, you know, what, how, should the, how should we respond? What are the benefits and costs of responding? I want to take one example. I have high blood pressure, okay? Dam lachatz? Dam lachatz gavoa. I don't know how to say it. But anyway, I have high blood pressure. I take a little pill in the morning. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but I take it, okay? The reason I'm not sure it's a good idea is that I'm pretty sure it lowers my measured blood pressure, but I'm not sure it actually improves my health. Those are not the same thing, right? There's a lot of medical things that you do that improve the symptom, but not the underlying cause. But I think this is probably good for me. So I come to Israel. I didn't take this before I came to Israel. This is, this is the result of being in Oleh Hadash, Maybe, yep, the classic um, uh, fallacy is, in Latin, is post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. I'm also 67 years old, okay? My dad had high blood pressure. My brother is younger than me. He has high blood pressure. So it's probably not the Israeli bureaucracy. It's probably just getting older. Okay, so I go to the, uh, my health provider, Maccabi, and they give me uh, uh, medicine for my high blood pressure. How much does it cost? I don't know. It's so cheap, it's free, basically. It's $10, I don't even pay attention to it. I don't say, well, if it's gonna be that expensive, I'll only take it every other day. I take it every day. Is there a price that would be so high I would take it every other day, maybe, but I take it every day. It's cheap. And if I was not an economist, I might believe that this is a triumph of the Israeli healthcare system, that blood pressure medicine is so inexpensive. But unfortunately, I know better. Because most of the drugs that we take here in Israel are inexpensive. Why? Because somebody in America had a chance to make a huge amount of money charging what's something closer to a market price. In fact, not a market price, a monopoly price. Somebody who invents this probably invented this particular blood pressure medicine, was able to have a, a, a monopoly, a patent, for seven, you get it for 17 years, you usually don't get to enjoy the full 17 years, but for some number of years in America, you get to charge basically whatever you want. And the reason it's whatever you want is that most people who are taking the pill in America are not paying for it with their own money. 
Their insurance company is paying for it. The government's paying for it through Medicare and Medicaid, two different programs that subsidize medicine. So it's a fantastic world for drug companies in America. They make a huge amount of money. Who's it bad for? Well, the American taxpayer, because somebody has to pay, even though the government's paying in Medicare and Medicaid, someone's got to pay the taxes to pay that. But the other person who gets a good deal is me in Israel, because Israel doesn't let is American companies charge whatever they want. They negotiate their own prices. If you want access to our market, you have to sell it cheap. So it's fantastic. And, it's a, and you could argue, now to answer your question, sorry, long introduction, you could argue this is, oh, come on, medicine. This is a necessity. Well, the reason that necessity is available to me here in Israel at a very low price, which is effectively subsidized by the Israeli government, is because in America, they let, they let the market work worse than the market. They let a monopoly work, created a huge incentive for new drugs, which is great for me, not so good for American taxpayers, not so good for people in America who don't have the insurance because they have to pay the full price and there's ways to get it and so on. There's other, I don't want to over-dramatize the, the downside of the American drug system, but the American drug system and the American drug, uh, medical device market is fantastic for the rest of the world. <laughs> the rest of the world's being subsidized so you could argue, oh, yeah, it's really important that it be really cheap. Well, that's if it exists. And it does exist because of this other crazy system that's been created to subsidize uh, that drug companies have political power. It is literally against the law in America for Medicare, which takes care of the ever-growing population of old people, to negotiate price. This is insane. It's insane. But there's no market. It, you can say, well, okay, there's no market for a few years. I'm off the topic now. I'm on a different topic. Side note. You could argue, well, you know, they get a monopoly for a few years and you need that to create the incentive, you do, to do the research because it really takes a long time and it's really expensive. Shouldn't forget that. It's not merely a chance for American drug companies to make a lot of money. It's important that they have the opportunity to make a lot of money because it gives them the incentive. And by the way, isn't it horrible that, 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 that pharmaceutical companies make money off of people's diseases? That's an outrage. These things should be, all be free. Of course, then you have to have an incentive to get them to do the research. And isn't it strange that we don't say to doctors, you're, making, you're charging people to be a doctor? I mean, medicine is so important. Shouldn't you volunteer? Shouldn't you have given up your life savings to go to medical school so you could provide free health care? Somehow, Profit is bad for pharmaceutical companies, but for doctors, it's okay, they can charge whatever they want. I mean, the whole system is insanely crazy, not so good. And I'm off the track. Ed, we're out of time. Thank you. We'll continue talking. Uh